Um, so obviously the world has changed quite a bit in the last six months. Uh, we've been following the development of large language models for a while, but they've uh, surprised even us with the the level and rate at which they've developed in, in the last year. So what I wanted to do with this webinar is to uh, walk through our perspective on what they what they bring to the world and how they fit in with uh, the Wolfram worldview that uh, we've been developing for quite a long time now. Now, um, ultimately, this isn't really a comparison between ChatGPT and Wolfram or Wolfram Alpha as build. It's really a discussion of uh, statistical AI approaches versus symbolic AI approaches. So. In, from that perspective, um, what the ChatGPT and the other large language models are, are statistical AI. Their job is, and I'm going to dehype this uh, uh, somewhat because I'm no believer in the, um, we're on the verge of general artificial intelligence or the uh, destruction of the world, because what large language models do is statistically predict words. Their job is simply to say what word comes next or what sequence of words comes next in a sequence of words. Um, and what makes them exciting is that they've managed to do this. The statistical patterns they've developed are, have been very profound at capturing the essence of long and short term structures in in text and knowledge. So as well as knowing that uh, it's uh, it's about time for a, a verb in a sentence, they know how to relate the last sentence of a story to the beginning, first sentence of a story. They're building up those kinds of patterns. So this prediction of words actually turns out to be capable of answering uh, predicting words to answer a question or predicting the explanation that follows the statement, or other kinds of things that have very human appearance of intelligence, such as uh, responses that seem to obey instructions. But fundamentally, what they're doing is guessing, probabilistically, what words come next. And in fact, by their very design, uh, they do that with a certain amount of randomness thrown in, because it turns out they don't look nearly as human if they simply give the, the most likely next word. They always try and uh, give something out of one of them several likely words that comes next, um, which makes them much more surprising and, uh, and relatable, but also makes them uh, fundamentally unpredictable. Now, on the other hand, Wolfram has always, uh, for the last 35 years, been building out the symbol symbolic AI world. And I'm going to define that uh, as taking uh, structured information, such as images or algebraic maths or documents, and and operating on those with very defined rules of behavior. So while some algorithms are non-deterministic uh, or uh, are seeded randomly, fundamentally we're trying to produce reproducible steps uh, pretty much for all of the computations that we do. Well, I'm sure most of you in this webinar have some uh, uh, sense of what that means in practice, what we've been building at Wolfram Research for the last 35 years. But just to give you a sense of what that is, uh, we call it computation and it's pulling together all of the world's algorithms from all kinds of different uh, areas of computation. So that includes algorithms that have enabled things like uh, um, large language models, all kinds of uh, statistics and machine learning and neural network algorithms, sort of classical statistics, but all kinds of areas of computation that aren't sort of pure data science like uh, geocomputation or network analysis or seasonally adjusted forecasts on time series and uh, um, and things like geometry and optimization and um, you know all kinds of different data like audio and video and uh, text analysis and a lot of it is very domain specific so we've built out algorithms for all kinds of science and uh, from sort of traditionally computable subjects like uh, like uh, physics and and maths but also algorithms from more recently computable subjects like biology and uh, and so on and uh, across engineering fields and all kinds of modeling on top of that. So this is a big lexicon, but they all basically follow this idea that there are prescribed algorithms that understand specific pieces of behavior, which we then assemble to try and apply to, to the real world. Now, at this point, those of you who know a bit about us might think, but hang on a moment, you've got Wolfram Alpha. That's different, isn't it? Wolfram Alpha takes natural language and produces answers. Isn't that exactly what ChatGPT is trying to do? Well, on the surface, superficially, they look pretty similar. You type a question in, you get an answer out. But if you peel back the surface of Wolfram Alpha, the way that we've gone about it is fundamentally different to the large language model approach. Because as fast as possible in the Wolfram Alpha world, we dispense with a, with a natural language. So we have a generalized grammar rules that deconstructs the sentences and tries to turn it into a symbolic representation of a question, usually something of the form of what is the property of this entity or what is uh, uh, 
the value of this piece of data pushed through this algorithm, something very precise and symbolic. And then once, we're, once we've reached this point, we're in this computation world, this symbolic AI world, AI world. So we've got collections of algorithms that know what to do with different kinds of data, real-time data feeds, uh, and built-in sources of knowledge. We do computation, and then we use a templating system to put the computation into uh, the framing of some words to give it sentences. So none of the processing in the middle in the Wolfram Alpha world uh, uh, um, is done in um, in kind of language that's stripped away as early as possible and then re-injected at the very end. So given that we have things like Wolfram Alpha, it might be reasonable to ask, is this some kind of existential quest, uh, uh, risk to Wolfram Alpha that large language models seem to have come along and uh, and done an excellent job at the thing that uh, that we've been building. And you know, at first, you know, we were you know concerned about those kinds of things as well until we kind of started analyzing the strengths and weaknesses. And it turns out that if you break it down, the strengths and weaknesses of the large language model approach and the computation approach are almost diametrically opposite. They're, they're very complementary technology. So um, on the computation side, um, we're very good at the logical thinking, following rules working with big data, reliability on the large language model side, they're very good at wide range of inputs, human-like interaction and undefined fields and unstructured data. Um, and to make that better, I'm just gonna go through those one at a time and uh, and show you what I mean by, and why I've sort of ticked and crossed the boxes on that. So here's a, a kind of computational thinking type thing, the kind of thing that uh, there are examples of um, large language models doing really interesting um, having really interesting capabilities here, but fundamentally they're not very good at it. So those are the outliers where they really seem to be able to assemble um, logical thought. Actually, it very quickly breaks down. Um, all my examples here are ChatGPT 3.5, but uh, uh, while GPT-4 is has, has improved on that, they're still fundamental to the approach of LLMs. So here I've asked this sort of simple logic problem, Alice is older than Bob, Bob's older than Charlie, Charlie's younger than Derek, and then ask the question is, Alice older than Derek. So the ChatGPT answer comes back with an argument uh, that says, yes, Alice is older than Bob, and uh, and here's the uh, the explanation of why. But actually, if you stop and think about it carefully, the answer is it's unknown. Now, in the quantifier elimination world of being able to take that as a kind of logically stated set of uh, inequalities and using Wolfram languages uh, for all and reduce functionality, we can conclude that that is not a true statement. Uh, and in fact, if we um, ask it the other way around, uh, we can say, is she in fact younger? We can see that that is also not true, that this is an indeterminate uh, a question. Um, we cannot strictly say it I either way. And this is quite a simple you know, 10 word problem. So if you think about the, the kind of um, larger scale logic problems where you are working with systems of thousands of equations and thousands of unknowns, that is never going to be within reach of, of the um, large language model approach. But actually it goes even deeper than that because the large language models can't even handle uh, any kind of rules in a kind of safe and systematic way. So something as basic as arithmetic is fundamentally beyond them. That when you ask most arithmetic questions in ChatGPT, it gets them right because you mostly ask questions involving two, three, four digit numbers. And it's pretty much seen every combination of adding and subtracting and multiplying those numbers. But as soon as the numbers get a bit more uh, bigger or the arithmetic gets more complicated, like uh, this, I don't know how many digits I got here, eight, nine digit numbers, we can see that compared to the correct answer, it's looking plausible because the, the first three digits are correct, but after that, all of the digits are just fiction. And that's just arithmetic. When you go to something more complex, like asking it for some calculus, we get back this uh, this plausible looking answer. And and again, an explanation of uh, some of the reasoning for why that is and what it means. But if you compare it to the Wolfram answer, they are almost completely different. Um, the A lot of the, the symbols and bits are the same. It's sort of using the, the, the right words of maths, but just in the wrong order and in, in the wrong structure. Um, so there are things they have in common. It seems to have recognized there's likely to be a sine 2x going on involved in here. And uh, and for some reason, it's also agreed on the quarter, but the structure of the thing as a whole is, is completely different. And again, this is a relatively simple uh, piece of algebraic mix. So really it comes down to that whenever you have things that have precise rules and you have to repeat them or apply combinations of them very quickly, um, uh, the LLM approach, 
uh, breaks down. And in a way, perhaps that's understandable since it's trying to produce very kind of human-like behavior uh, and the approach it's taken is very verbal. We're very bad at doing maths in our heads and uh, spoken out loud. So perhaps it's the same kind of uh, reason why we find maths hard to study and we, we spend a long time uh, developing the, the skills to be able to do this maths ourselves as humans. Um, so another thing I said was a weakness for large language models is big data, which seems surprising because we read that they're trained on uh, on terabytes of natural language. The training is on big data, but actually when you use the large language model, they have um, a kind of working memory known as an, known as an attention. And in GPT 3.5 that I'm, I was using for this example, that is about 2,000 tokens. Uh, for GPT-4, it's about 20,000 tokens. But so I've rather meanly contrived this example where I've given it a list of 2,000 items and said, what's the last item in the list? The kind of the, the simplest data science question you could ask, what's the last element? And you can see that it uh, it fails at that because the the question is falling off out of the out of its memory by the time the last data is arriving. It simply can't hold all of that you know, to be able to process it. And of course, in uh, data science world, 2,000 items is nothing. It's, uh, uh, you know, even Excel can handle that quite happily. Uh, it's you know, trivial for me to ask the same question uh, with a randomly generated 10 million element list and instantaneously I, I, can, I can do that accurately. Um, and certainly it's routine in, in our world to be working with, uh, you know, hundreds of megabytes, gigabytes, even larger amounts of uh, data, not 2,000 items. But this is the thing most people are talking about, and it's it's again it's it's a fundamental issue, which is reliability. Um, and you'll notice I've used the word plausible actually quite a few times already, because in a way that's its target function: is uh, the LLMs are trying to produce words that seem likely and plausible. Their job is not to be correct or to know the answer to things. That's an emergent behavior that comes as as a side effect of trying to sound plausible. Um, but the the key thing is plausibility. So here's a typical question I've asked it. Uh, provide data on livestock populations in Turkey. And here's the, the answer that it gave me. Um, and I've highlighted uh, two bits of the answer there that uh, it's claiming there's 33.4 million sheep. Um, uh, and it's given me a citation to try and make it more convincing. Now, GPT, uh, ChatGPT has been known to completely invent citations. So I thought oh, this would be great to, as an example to show an invented citation. Actually, on this occasion, it's a real citation. Turkstat is a real thing, and it does hold populations of uh, livestock. So it's made a really good match there with suggesting Turkstat. But I took the time to go and uh, crawl through the, uh, the tree structure of Turkstat to find the relevant page. And here I finally stumbled upon the documents that it's citing, um, that the 2020 corrected uh, animal populations. And we can see that it's a different number. So um, in fact, all of the numbers are wrong. They're all in the right ballpark, but they're all different numbers that it's made up that sound roughly right. But to me, even more dangerous than the fact that it can't get the numbers right is that it makes an effort to try and convince me of the correctness. You know, like the loudmouth man down the pub who claims to be an expert on everything and shares his wisdom, but actually turns out to know nothing. It's saying with confidence to cover up its lack of preciseness. Now, so far, I've, I've been very negative about LLMs. They are amazing, and they do some things that are really big improvements. Uh, one that's interesting to us, of course, is that they can take a really wide range of inputs. So here's a typical query you could type into Wolfram Alpha, uh, asking for the, um, things like the largest country. Or, um, but I've tried to mangle the question by elaborate use of words, um, You know, tried to use obscure words and um, uh, and you know, not a natural word ordering. And in the GPT world, in the LLM world, uh, it can rephrase that into the short, concise 10 word version and unscramble that complexity. Uh, Wolfmouth would completely choke on that uh, question in the way that I've phrased it in the, the input. And so that ability to strip away the, the, the confusing paraphernalia of language to convert to the essence actually is a really powerful feature that we want to be able to make wide use of. Of course, the thing that amazes everyone, and there's no denying it, they are great at writing uh, human-like words. So all kinds of uh, fun things they can do where you can ask it to describe a topic in a style. So here it's, uh, I asked it to explain Wolf Mouth for a, in language for a seven-year-old, and it's, uh, it's done a pretty good job of that. I've taken a large amount of text and asked it to pracy that down to a few words. 
and it's made a great summary. I can go the opposite direction and say, here's a point I want to make. Write me a little a paragraph that makes that point well. And it can synthesize words. It can transform words. It can extract essence. Um, it can write poetry. It can uh, do all kinds of uh, amazing things uh, with words. And really, um, you know, that, that is an amazing breakthrough compared to the state of the art for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, perhaps a little harder to know whether it's useful or not. Large language models uh, do something interesting, at least, with really poorly defined or poorly understood fields. Uh, so I don't know why I thought of this, but this was my example. How should I train a dog to sing? I have no idea whether this really would work, but at least it has something to say about it. And in the computation world, you know, uh, I lead a technical services team here in Europe and we take customer projects. I know if some customer came to me before this technology came along and said, I want you to build an algorithm for training a dog to sing. That's a serious invention task, and I wouldn't know where to start, and I'd want lots of uh, uh, data and feedback, and I don't know where I'd go. It'd be a, it would be a major research undertaking to do that algorithmically. Um, and we got something useful here with zero effort. And the last thing I'm listing is one of the key strengths, and this is an important one, which I'll come back to a little bit later in, in the presentation, is handling of unstructured data. So I've given it a fairly straightforward thing here, which is a sentence, say, two basset hounds were walking down the street and they met a Persian cat talking to a Labrador. And I'm asking how many dogs are mentioned in, in, the, in that text? And, you know, there is, there is a combination of, of word matching to understand that a Persian cat isn't a dog, that a Labrador and a basset hound are. It's got to have associated the words to and a with the right... Uh, uh, nouns going on there, and it's got to pull that together to make the number three. So this is kind of amazing that it can take that and 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 take that unstructured mess of information and extract the key facts that I wanted to to get out of it. Um, and really, I think in many ways this is the more exciting thing than the ability to chat to the computer. That's the thing that everyone's excited about because it's you know finally the Star Trek computer. But but. Um, this is really a profound change to be able to handle and structure data that is as important as conversation. So that's the pros and cons. We've got these two worlds, and uh, you know, in many ways, it's it's like the classic, although inaccurate, model of the human brain that there's a left brain for for logical, rational thinking, and the right brain is for poetry and language and uh, um, and and emotion. And like any rounded person, we need to have um, we need to bring together the skills from both halves of of that of that capacity. So what we've been thinking about um, uh, really since uh, before shortly before this really made news when we were first brought on the inside of the announcements that were 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 coming is how do we pull those two worlds together? And that's where for those of you who've heard about the, our the, the announcements that are public so far of the ChatGPT plugin, and we've announced. Uh, so we were invited to be one of the first plugins uh, by OpenAI. We've also been invited to be part of the first round of plugins for the Bing version, for the uh, Google Bard version, and we're working with other AI providers to provide plugins that aren't yet public. Um, that's the kind of simplest mechanism for pulling the two together. So um, let's uh, let's uh, switch to a browser here for a moment, and let's tr uh, do this one live if. Uh, OpenAI on my free account is forgiving enough to give me some CPU time. And uh, we'll ask the question. I've got the Wolfram plugin enabled here at the top. And I'm going to ask the same question that I used as an example before, which was uh, tell me about livestock populations in Turkey. So, ChatGPT is going to start thinking about those words and uh, assembling some, uh, some uh, sequence of text. But the first thing it's done is uh, recognized that this is something we might have something useful to say. So it's this little used Wolfram pod has come up. And what that was doing is behind the scenes, it's called Wolfram Alpha and said, you know about livestock population, give me the numbers. The numbers have then come back and it's used those numbers. It tends not to um, hallucinate and make things up when you provide it with facts and say, use these numbers. And it's woven them into its, uh, its answer. And I guess I could go a bit further and that and say bar chart that. And uh, that will also hopefully recognize that bar charts are something that we know about in the Wolfram world. So again, we get using Wolfram and it's calling us and it's hopefully going to get a moment, a moment it will say used Wolfram. 
Um, it's okay. Here's the answer coming back. And so we've taken, it's taken the data from the first part, carried that forward in the context of the conversation, passed it to us where we produced a bar chart and we fed back a URL so that this bar chart can be displayed into the chat. And now we're also escaping the world of words because we've, we're generating pictures, um, even though LLMs uh, as they stand are kind of strictly in the, in the world of words. But that's one way around. That's um, Wolfram is a plugin to chat GPT. The, the, the intelligence that's in charge there is the large language model. It's receiving the question and it's deciding that we have something useful to contribute. Um, and it's making the decision to call us. And it's making the decision how to use the, um, uh, the result that comes back. So the LLM is totally in charge in that conversation. You, we're just inject, injecting facts back into the conversation in order to avoid the hallucination. We also want to do this the other way around. And so I'm going to show some features here that are coming in the next release of the Wolfram language. Um, and here I'm I'm within the Wolfram language, so I'm in a code world. You know, you would layer a user interface over the top once you've built your application, uh, whether that's through notebooks or, or, um, or web sites or hiding it behind a, um, an API. But at the code level, I'm setting up an LLM function. So this is a function that's going to be powered by the L large language model. And um, I should point out here, this is LLM function, not chat GPT function, because we want to be agnostic to the back end. So there are some options to say which back end I want to use. At the moment, we only have um, OpenAI's back end, but the plan is that that will just be a choice to be able to flip that to different, cheaper, more expensive. Um, so for example, choosing between GPT-4 and 3, affects the billing. So we might want to use the lower model um, unless it's complicated and then switch to the high one. But what it's doing is it's setting up a, a function that will be evaluated in the LLM world, which is write a blast summary of a of blast share price uh, yesterday, given the following facts. So now I can use that function as if it's a built-in function in the Wolf language. I can just say, right, I want a, some text, which is the finance story. And here's the parameters being filled in. If I was doing this right, I would probably have some model for projecting uh, whether I thought the shares were going up or down and uh, and make this positive or negative depending on my model. But here I'm just going to randomly choose between exciting, optimistic, and pessimistic. Um, I threw in the word automatically, uh, and I'm fetching Wolfram Alpha's financial data. So that one of the things that the LLMs don't do um, in their core technology is they can't do anything with live data because they're pre-trained on a snapshot of data that... Um, is frozen somewhere in the middle of last year when the training runs were done. Um, so we're fetching live data and feeding that into the slots in here. So this will become right an exciting summary of Microsoft share price given the following open high, high low close numbers. And here's what it came up with when I ran it uh, about an hour ago to um, uh, when I was testing this, that this uh, machine was good for this talk. Uh, so the numbers here all came from us. The narrative was written by large language model, but we were in charge. We demanded from the LLM that we wanted these words rather than it making some decision to call us. Now, the, the Wolfram plugin is, is already kind of interesting for filling in a lot of that sort of knowledge and computational gap in the LLM, but it is very generic. One of the things we want to do is to be able to um, combine um, your knowledge to make specific plugins that uh, that do more than the kind of generic um, computation. So once you kind of open up your mind to that idea, that's all kinds of uh, bi-directional things that a plugin that actually had privileged access to your world could do. It could, it could answer questions using your private information from your database. It could action things in the real world in the way that, you know, we use Alexa to control our heating and, and so on. We can action things in the outside world. As soon as we've got a, a plugin in the Wolfram language world, everything that we can do with computation becomes available to chat or uh, contrive chat. Um, and what that looks like, actually turns out to be really simple because we've built a lot of the infrastructure for symbolically representing symbolic knowledge. We built infrastructure for deploying things, building automatic APIs for import and export uh, and asynchronous operations. All of these things we've been building for years because we've used it for deploying applications that are built in the Wolfram language uh, into organizations infrastructure. So this is, uh, is the plugin command that 
create a custom chat GPT plugin. And uh, what it does here is it, um, it, it declares a plugin with a certain name. So we can have more than one of those, but there's one here, which is called UK Income Tax Calculator. And it's got more than one or more endpoints. In this case, just one endpoint, which is the tax due endpoint. And then that's the symbolic representation of an API that will serve um, the parameter income with some calculation. And I pick this example because actually from the UK tax point of view, it's kind of amusing that um, a few governments ago, uh, the government wanted to raise income tax, didn't want to admit to it. And so it hid the personal allowance, which is the tax-free bit of your income. Uh, they made that go down as your income went up. So they could say the top rate of tax hasn't changed, but they were raising more tax from rich people. And so that really confuses uh, GPT. It can't do these tax calculations um, because of uh, this bit of the calculation that changes the personal allowance. So having set that up, I've got an API endpoint, and I'm going to walk you through the steps, actually. I probably already have it installed here, but let's uh, go and do a new chat and uh, go to plugins. And I um, let's uninstall the existing plugin because I've already got this installed here. Um, so I want to do uh, plugins, plugin store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and OK, I'm just going to copy this by hand. So what was it? It was johnm.assets. Um, assets, orphancloud.com. In paste. Right, so we're telling uh, uh, it to go to the endpoint and it finds it. So it says, okay, I recognize that. That looks like a valid uh, chat GPT plugin. I'll say install that and acknowledge my way through a couple of warnings. And now the plugin has been added to my list and let's uninstall the um, the remove the wolf plugin and let's just leave this new custom one. And if this works, I can now say, what UK tax would I pay on an income of, let's be rich here, of uh, 114,000 pounds income. So if I've done this right, already from the fact that the plugin has got names like income tax calculator, it's guessed the usefulness of it. If I was doing this properly, I would give it additional uh, information uh, of the where you would apply this and what circumstances, what it produces, what it gives out. And I can do all of that through prompt engineering, but it's already guessed what it's for and what the parameters are from the description of the code. And now it's done the same thing. It's called this new plugin and it's used this, albeit very trivial custom bit of knowledge um, that's running now in the Wolfram Cloud that I just created. So in a few seconds, we've we've got a plugin that has knowledge that is you know, potentially secret to me. And on the Wolfram Cloud, that could be potentially doing a database connect my databases and pulling uh, data out that is clearly not available to the, the wider public. Now, that's um, that's one way around. That's the GPT in charge. But we also, just like uh, our plugins, we want to have the opposite way around. And so we have the same business going on within the uh, within the language. And this is what it looks like from the language point of view. Um, we're using LLM synthesize to say we want to use the LLM infrastructure to uh, answer some question or to write some text. So here's the instruction on what I wanted to do, which is to write a short paragraph comparing Chicago, New York. And if I just did that on its own, it would write me a nice short paragraph, uh, probably about uh, you know what the nice buildings are. I don't know what it'll come up with, whatever it feels like. But I'm giving it a bit more information. The LLM evaluator is where you tell it which the back end is, whether you're using BARD or GPT and what model and what the temperature is. But I'm also dropping in this extra piece of information that there is a tool available to it, which is a tool called City Finder Population, which will do the following thing, which has the following parameters and runs the following Wolfram language code. So in the same way that has happened when it said using Wolfram, when I call this LLM synthesize, these words are written by um, by the LLM, but this time under code instruction, but it still made the decision to um, come back and get these numbers. So rather than injecting the numbers in saying, I want you to use this number for the population and this number for the population, the way that I did with the finance example, this one is left it up to the LLM to decide, but we're controlling the thing from, from Wolfram language code. Right, um, so that's sort of the, you know, what we're trying to address with the plugins, arbitrary ways of injecting facts, injecting reliability, making LLMs able to call the, the comp computable world, allowing the computable world to fetch 
uh, narrative when it needs it, and all of that sort of infrastructure that you can build your applications on top of to be able to leverage both best of both worlds. But I said one of the things I was I thought was exciting was unstructured data. So I want to talk about that a little bit. In the end, the infrastructure is exactly the same. We're going to use LLM function and the like to be able to um, connect to external APIs to call on that world. And you know, when these these smaller models that people are developing come on stream and become more reliable, that might be calling an LLM that's running right on my machine in private without having to use external APIs at all. But we're not quite at that stage yet. Um, and I've actually grouped together here, not just unstructured data, but unstructured tasks. Because I've had a line that I've used for a long time when I talk about machine learning versus classical modeling, which is if you're understanding, uh, if you're data rich and understanding poor, then machine learning is the way to go. And if you're, uh, the converse holds though, that if you are understanding rich and data poor, then using the physics or you know the, the equations of the system are the much better way to model. I now see a kind of third strand, which is, if you don't really know what to do, but you kind of know it when you see it, you can describe it and you can recognize it, but you're not really quite sure how to do it. That's a really good place for the for these tasks that the LLMs can help with. So let's um, pick through a few examples here. Um, we'll start with, um, with perhaps the, the kind of low hanging fruit, one of the easiest things that is obviously useful is, uh, is uh, data extraction from unstructured data. So, it turns out that large language models have an interesting emergent behavior, which is in-context learning. In the classical machine learning world, if you wanted to learn something, you give it lots of thousands and thousands of examples and you train the weights of the model until it's learned that. And that's how the LLM was created. Um, but LLMs are incredibly expensive. The, the really big ones like GPT-4 are very expensive to train. A full training run is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars of CPU time beyond all but the biggest organizations. But it turns out that in the context of the question, you can give it a light training through examples. And it does a reasonably good job of using that in many situations. So we built, uh, as a kind of next level up from the LLM function, uh, a primitive called LLM example function, whose job is to take input and output examples, kind of like Classify does, but using the LLM technology. So um, it actually seems to extrapolate really well from a small number of examples. So here I've used three examples. This is what I think it might see a piece of text that's uh, talking about some people. And in that example, what I want it to do is to produce um, a, a string that is the, um, the Wolfram language expression for an association of key value pairs with those values in. So I want it to label, uh, find the word John, which comes from here, and label it with name. And I want to um, find this 52-year-old bit here and label that with age. But when I do that, I want that to be a Wolfram language unit. So it's going to be a quantity in the quantity of years. And I've got three of these examples. This one uh, illustrates what happens if uh, something isn't mentioned, I've got a missing. This one illustrates what happens if you've got two people mentioned in the same sentence. And that gives us now this LLM example function. And that's already pretty good at taking similar kinds of text not the same, not doesn't have to be one of those exact patterns, but things that are of similar complexity and being able to extract that data. So here I've given it this unseen data here um, and I've shaken the sentences up a bit so they're in different orders and uh, um, you know I've tried to separate the height a little bit from the word tool, um, but it's able to take that sentence and extract it out into a computable data structure with units that are immediately computable. So I could, what I've done, what have I done here? I've taken the first record here that age, so the 70 year value, and actually convert that to days because it's in the Wolfram language. It's now immediately computable with all of our computational infrastructure. So this is um, a really powerful paradigm for setting up functions where you kind of can describe the task, just like I would with a junior employee, where I'd sit them down and say, here's the job. You've got to get these values out of this data. Uh, here's a couple of examples. You've got the idea, off you go. But it turns out to be quite flexible in the kinds of things that it can do. So here's a sort of different uh, example. This time we're going to numerical values. I'm building a, um, a social media moderator function that wants to detect offensive posts in public. And I just train it with some examples. I show it, uh, um, uh, this is an example of a zero offensiveness. And in my scale, the uh, I know where you live and I'm coming to kill you is the most offensive thing on here. Um, uh, I tried to make it presentation uh, friendly because obviously we'd have a whole bunch of other things in that that would show up that we want to give examples of. But just from those ten examples, give it a sense of uh, this 
escalating scale of offensiveness, is able to take some uh, phrase here and say, oh, you've uh, thrown in a mild insult in here. That's a six on my scale, something equivalent to the uh, you are a moron um, level of, or somewhere between you are a moron and you're an ugly donkey level of offensiveness. Here's one that's not quite so obviously the same thing. Um, this was a, a project that I was discussing with uh, a medical chat company who were taking voice over phone transcriptions to be able to make use of the um, the conversation. And the transcriptions go wrong because they're listening phonetically. And while they do error checking, like, is that a real word? And they, they fix um, jumbles of syllables that don't appear to be a word into a word. They don't understand the context of the conversation. So in the same kind of way, I, with, in this case, uh, two examples, I've shown it examples of how to, um, uh, uh, how to fix uh, a mistranscription. So I've got this phrase that's in the topic of hearts. Heart disease, Asian populations um, might be actually a mistranscription uh, of atrial fibrillation. So they sound vaguely similar, and you can imagine with a poor pronunciation and a phone line that it could mistranscribe that. And already, it can do useful things. So here's the unseen data. I'm uh, not even in the context of hearts. I'm just now in a completely different context. But I told him that in the context of eyes, I have cats and a glad aroma. And it says that's probably I have cataracts and glaucoma as, as the correction, which is you know kind of impressive. In reality, you might give it 30, 40, 50 examples. You've got to allow for the context of your LLM because you can't give it more than the 2,000 or 20,000 uh, tokens. You can't give it tens of thousands of examples the way you would with, with training. But this works really well where you're low on data and low on understanding. Uh, should we do another one? Um, let's do the next one, which is kind of, yeah, this is kind of a useful one. So things like ontology mapping, it's very good at. So um, this time I'm not using the example function. I'm using the, I know what I mean, but I don't know how to do it approach. And I'm creating a function whose job is to convert a drug name uh, to be provided into the purpose of the drug. And this is a bit of prompt engineering because I don't want descriptions or essays about the drug. I just want it to return a single word. This is the kind of instructions you have to give LLMs. And from that, I've got a function that I can now map down a database of drugs in order to uh, put them into categorizations. And you can see here that my, my list of three drugs has uh, one analgesic and two anticoagulants in it. Um, now, in the old world, I would end up having to dump out all of the um, the, the values in one database and in another database and create some kind of mapping between them and maybe do some kind of uh, nearest spell check correction in case it said aspirins instead of aspirin. And there'd be all kinds of code and, uh, and data required to be able to execute that. And now uh, I haven't actually analyzed the reliability of this, but at some level it's working in what is 30 seconds worth of coding, which is, which is a real kind of breakthrough in, in data cleaning, which of course is the, um, the expensive part of, of data science. I'm going to skip these examples as I'm, time is getting on, and we will talk about a, another topic which comes out of this, which is um, large language models uh, actually are quite good at code. Um, there's a limit because it's a kind of computational thinking. So after above a certain size, um, they break down and start doing the wrong thing. But actually, they do slightly better at code than they do at maths because code has so many of the features of languages. It has a syntax. It has a kind of repetitive structure to it. Uh, you know, in the Wolf language, you've got openness, close, square brackets in a way that in English, you have full stops and commas. So it's used to these kinds of structures. And if we jump back to the LLM here, let's have a look at what happened in my Turkey example. Um, behind the scenes, uh, there's kind of an interesting detail here that there are two ways that the two systems have talked to each other. In the first one, it did that kind of question rephrasing that I talked about earlier, where it's, uh, well, it hasn't had to do much. It's thrown away the words, tell me about. But it's turned that into a Wolfram Alpha style natural language query, something we can parse. And it's used English to English as its way of conversing with the external system. In the case of the bar chart, uh, it's conversed using Wolfram language code. So it's actually synthesized the code for a bar chart including the options and uh, and uh, any styling information. And then it's executed that code on our servers. And then we've returned the result of the execution. Um, now, obviously, there are sandboxing issues. We take care of that in the Wolfram Cloud already. Um, uh, you, know, you don't want the LLM to suddenly fantasize that what you really asked for was uh, uh, file delete star dot star. Um, 
recursive and that it suddenly does some harm. So you have to sandbox the, the execution. But this ability to write um, code is elevates the ability of the LLM to be able to do computational tasks because where it would get muddled, it can now synthesize some code um, that can be executed and compute the, the value. Now, that actually leads us on to a kind of new paradigm, which is um, one of our challenges has always been that Wolf language, of course, is a is a is a lower popularity language com compared to things like Excel, Python, and uh, and things that people get taught routinely at college or uh, in the workplace. And so, one of the barriers has always been how do we get people through those first few hours, couple of days of learning the Wolf language so they can be productive. Well, this now bridges that gap. And so, um, you know, we thought about how to do that, code assistance tools, that's one way, code checking uh, on errors. So we've been building some of those things in, but one of the paradigms that we've um, led on for 30 years is the concept of a notebook. And in, in a way, um, ChatGPT is like the computational world was back in the 1980s before we invented the computable notebook, which is you did things through the command line and the stuff that I've done earlier, well, that's gone. I can't go back and edit that. It's just a immutable record of things that I typed and I have one point of entry and then it's frozen as it goes up. And we invented the notebook to make computation much more interactive. So you could go back and edit things, you could uh, um, reevaluate things and you could explore much more freely. So we've taken that paradigm and brought it to the world of notebooks. Um, so the idea is that uh, I can type in here um, into the notebook, into this chat thing, something that I would like to achieve in the notebook. So uh, let's make um, uh, plot the uh, differences, maybe differences between uh, the first 500 primes. Hopefully what will happen now is uh, this will call uh, our preferred LLM, which will synthesize some code for us. And uh, we can uh, go and say, okay, that looks like good code. Let's run that. Okay, that's good. Uh, we let's carry the conversation forward. It will remember the context like it does in a, a chat session. So uh, what would I do with this? Let's do uh, uh, add a moving average with uh, a window of, what is it, 500 points. Let's have a window of 20 points. And uh, you can use that context now to take the code it already wrote and modify that. This is looking like it's done a decent job. Uh, and there's our now moving average of the differences and times and the patterns start emerging. But this is all uh, all uh, modifiable. So I can go back up to the top and say, actually, now that I've got this thing working, what do I do to change this to a thousand times? I can reevaluate that and everything below will use that context when I ask further questions. Um, so it's resynthesized the code. Um, and we think there's kind of all kinds of interesting things that can be done in this in terms of uh, injecting context into the notebook. So you can have a notebook that is given a notion of a persona. So you could say this notebook is going to um, speak uh, to the person like they're a five-year-old, it's for children. You can pre-decide that we're in the context of, um, uh, of, uh, of say, um, physics and stick to the conversation in that space. Uh, we can prime it with things that it might want to uh, talk to me about. And then the conversation is, is pre-led. You open the notebook and you type chat, and it'll say, no, 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 we're talking about physics. Uh, we're not going to talk about the weather today and keep you on topic. I, uh, had an, I put together an example that was for writing lessons plans. And it asks you uh, as its first step, what do you want to plan on? And you say uh, causes of World War II. And then it says, and what age group? And you say five-year-olds. And then it writes a little lesson plan step by step. And it's been given some prompt engineering to tell it what a lesson plan should look like so that it can just appear like it knows what I want in the first place. Now, I've been using this uh, phrase prompt engineering uh, throughout, and, and it's an interesting new paradigm for expressing yourself because it's, it's linguistic programming. Prompt engineering is all about trying to describe what you want um, uh, so that the, the thing doesn't just write some fantastic essay about the topic and will go off on its own direction. And there are all kinds of lessons being learned about uh, how to, to to construct good prompts. And so we've been thinking a little bit about how to make prompt engineering easier. And our approach to that has been to launch this uh, prompt repository. And uh, I'm on the wrong screen here. So this is the, um, at the moment, it's mostly fairly empty because we've only uh, just put it up a few days ago. This is a repository where you can get prompts for particular tasks. And you can see here that um, there are various different uh, categorizations, possibly more to come. 
there are personas. These are all kind of stylistic things. Some of them, uh, you know, very useful, like speak formally or speak uh, in a relaxed, friendly manner or be a tutor. Those are kind of persona type things that are all about. Uh, the, uh, I mean, obviously, there are some uh, uh, kind of amusing uh, but pointless things in here, like speak like William Shakespeare or uh, speak like a gangster to give you the idea. But the idea is personas could be really about directing the the style of the conversation as well as the choice of words. Then there are functions which are things that can do useful tasks. And then there are modifiers that can transform things. And the idea is that um, like all of our repositories, these are deeply plumbed into the Wolfram language. So here's some examples of what those look like at a code level. Um, at a notebook level, if I go back here and uh, where's my prompt notebook? Um, um, actually, let's go back and show you this in the chat notebook before I do these code examples. Let's get a new chat notebook. We have the notion of the persona on the left here. Um, so I've got a few personas installed here. I'm going to use Bernardo, which is uh, one of these whimsical things. Uh, what can you help me with? And it will now take on the funky uh, Bernardo um, persona, which uh, likes to be really cool and uh, ends everything with an emoji and uh, is sarcastic and uh, irreverent. So in the, in the Notebook, we have this mechanism for being able to uh, reference these chat prompts and personas within the content. I can do this actually within the context and say uh, um, uh, something like, what is a black hole? But I'm going to add a modifier to that, which is going to be, um, and I don't know how to type hash on this keyboard. There we go. Nope. Which, um, uh, explain like I'm five. Now when I ask this, I'm modifying its natural behavior. It's got the default persona, but I've modified it, say, uh, you know, it speaks to me like a five-year-old, and now it's saying it's a really big, super strong vacuum cleaner, and that's its wording for it. So at the code level, uh, we're trying to do the same thing by having these things automatically download and install. So here's a typical LLM synthesize where it gives you a very prosaic answer when I ask it how many legs does a spider have. But if I want to do something computable, I might want to give it uh, the LLM prompt numeric only, which is one of these functional modifiers that says, uh, that ensures that the, what comes back from LLM synthesize is as, as, if possible, converted into a number. So now we just get the number back, not a description of the number. Um, here's a similar one, which is if I want a Boolean answer, I can put in the LLM prompt, I want this to be a strictly yes, no question. Should it eat spiders? And now instead of telling me why that's bad, it just says no. Oh, and here's the explain like I'm five uh, example within the code. Some of these things take um, take parameters as well. So um, the translate prompt can take a second parameter for the language. And now that's a quick way of saying I want to take that last answer, the black hole five-year-old explanation, and translate it into French or translate it into, uh, into formal medical speak or whatever the um, modifier is. So like our other repositories, the idea is anyone can contribute to these. I've got a few ideas that I want to add that I haven't got around to yet. Um, and hopefully we'll get away from the kind of uh, amusing whimsical things and build up a greater lexicon of the really useful functional things that can achieve certain tasks like categorization or uh, mapping of data um, and so on. Um, some of these prompts are very simple. They can be one-liners. Some of them are elaborate sort of 200 lines of explanation um, that will only work in GPT-4. So hopefully that gives you a, a sense of what we've been doing. Here's my kind of left brain, right brain uh, diagram again, um, but mapping out the two worlds of the, um, the, the probabilistic language approach and our Wolf Mouth for computation approach, but basically the building blocks we're trying to create are all of the connections one way or the other to be able to prime with uh, style, to be able to prime with facts, to be able to query computation, um, to be able to construct narrative uh, from computer or, uh, or LLM approach. And what might appear on the surface uh, might end up looking just like Wolfram Alpha, but behind the scenes, it's completely different. That You might have chat input and some kind of um, knowledge-based, computed, useful decision-making report at the end. Or it might be this is just invisible infrastructure and all you're seeing on the screen is the things that, are, that your app is doing and behind the scenes, we're using these kind of uh, LLM engineering to solve the tricky tasks of how do we process the data that informs your app and, and you may have no idea that words are ever involved in the process because it's just part of the, you know, it's just another paradigm of computation now from our everything is computation world viewpoint. 
So thank you very much for uh, for listening uh, patiently through that.